Um, another another piece of the book is is this idea of being whipped. You even have a word in there, pussy whipped. You said you you know you you heard it from your father. Um, there's there's a sense of uh, losing losing your your masculinity in a relationship. Can, can you talk to that a little bit? Like what what's the danger there? Having said all that, I've seen many relationships when where the men are. Um, being shamed into compliance where they're quiet, where they're small. And invariably, when a guy is what my father would have called pussy whipped, the woman resents the hell out of him. And it has nothing to do with him not being a real man. It has to do with him showing showing up or not showing up in the relationship. Women tend to be happier because they're very relational creatures on, on average. They tend to be happier when we actually show up and even when it means that we're disagreeing with them. You, you mentioned that you're married. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that at the moment your, your wife makes more money than you. Um, would you say that, what's your sense of what your wife prefers in terms of you showing up? Is, is your wife comfortable with you disagreeing with her? I am talking to Dr. Sean T. Smith. He is a psychologist in Colorado, Denver, Colorado. He is the author of numerous books, um, most recently, the he wrote Gatekeeper, The Tactical Guide to Commitment. Um, before that, he wrote The Tactical Guide to Women, How Men Can Manage Risk in Dating and Marriage. And before that, uh, Sean, if I'm not mistaken, you wrote books also geared at women um, about men. Um, so it seems like you've, you've written a lot about this sort of the relationship dynamics of men and women. Yeah, I did. I did write a couple of books for for women, um, just sort of talking about how men think and how they how they out move in in, uh, in romantic relationships. Um, I imagine that this covers a, a span of years. Uh, I've only read your most recent book. Um, do you feel like as you've written these books, uh, you've 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 sort of evolved in your thinking, or do you feel like these books are really all part of the same sort of uh, train of, of of thinking in in your practice and your work with people? I'd say both. I, I definitely evolve in my thinking. And, you know, when I, when I look back at some of my old writing, I cringe because I no longer agree with parts of it. Um, the tactical guide to women in particular is one that I still like, even though it's five years old now, I, I look at it now and I think, yeah, this, this still makes sense. There's obviously some things I would change about it if I could go back, but I don't cringe when I look at it. So that's usually a good sign as, as an author that you don't hate something that you wrote that long ago. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How does your writing relate to your clinical practice? It's it's a reflection of what I learn in my clinical practice. And I want to be real careful about saying that because I don't, you know, I talk about what goes on in my clinical practice, but I'm, I'm very careful to, to detach the information from any particular individuals, you know, so they're, they're composite sketches and they're, they're trends that I notice in my work and, and not individuals. But Part of the reason I write is so that I can remember what it is that I'm picking up as I go along. Who do you typically see in your practice? Who do you usually work with? These days I work with a lot of guys and guys are coming to me to, to sort of sort out their relationship patterns. And I would say there's, there's typically two guys that I work with, like two hypothetical figures. One is a younger guy in his twenties and thirties, who's thinking seriously about romantic relationships. And he's noticed that things have, he's got some patterns that aren't working out too well. And he's also noticing that the romantic environment certainly comes with particular risks for men, comes with risks for women too, but there's, there are some that are specific to men. And so he's wanting to um, build something with another woman, but he wants to be careful about it. He wants to do a better, he doesn't want to repeat the mistakes that he's seen in his family or among his friends and so forth. So that, that would be one hypothetical figure. And then the other would be an older guy, 40s, 50s, beyond starting over. He's had a relationship that maybe has a family that that um, he built a family. He's had a career. It all fell apart for whatever reason. He's starting over. He's thinking about reestablishing a new romantic relationship. And he wants to be careful that he doesn't repeat the same experience that he had the first time. Yeah, this this is sort of the the crux of the whole conversation, the whole book. But maybe just before we start, like, what what does that mean? Like, what does it look like to not repeat? You know, what what are the what are the the pointers? What are the insights? What are the what are the perspectives that you're you're trying to work with to sort of to sort of solve that to, to mitigate that risk? Yeah, that's that's the question. That's the question that I really tackled in Gatekeeper. And 
let me back up a little bit, talk about the the Tactical Guide to Women, which is the five-year-old book where I looked at what makes a woman, what gives a woman um, minimal competence to participate in a romantic relationship. And I took that that phrase, minimal competence, from my own clinical training, where you go through a doctoral program and at a certain point, if you're doing a clinical program, you do something called competency exams, where you get in front of all your supervisors and, and you have to demonstrate that you've learned something up to this point. And passing your comps doesn't mean that, at least in my program didn't mean that you're you're ready to go to work it just means that you are minimally competent you're no longer a complete idiot and so that's that's sort of what i i looked at in the tactical guide to women is what are the characteristics that that makes a woman capable of being a competent participant in a romantic relationship that was the biggest part of the book another part of the book was what you as a man bringing into the relationship but it focused mainly on women Gatekeeper is the book that I probably should have written first because it focuses almost exclusively on you as the reader. And I talk a lot about the patterns that men develop in their relationships, good and bad and otherwise, and how to identify those patterns within yourself so that you can pick and choose. You can have some freedom and and some agency over the types of relationships that you're building. You're not just flying on autopilot. So you're not just using what you saw in in your own upbringing from your elders and then repeating that in your life. And you're not just operating on whatever experiences you had in your life that left you a little bit scarred or a little bit jaded about relationships or whatever it is, you're a little bit frightened or a little bit over-enthusiastic or too trusting. Um, these patterns that that we all have, they operate underneath the level of awareness. And so if we, we don't put words to them, then we're just sort of reacting to the world and we're going out and we're, we're repeating relationship relationship experiences that we're familiar with because they fit. They may not work real well, but if we're comfortable with them, we're prone to, prone to repeating them. Mm -hmm. A question that I wonder when um, I read your book and I've seen some of your interviews is how do you think about the relationship between your work and your writing and your perspective and the question of patriarchy? Um, which is a word which is thrown around a lot in our in our modern world. What, what, is, what does that word mean to you? And how do you think about that? I've been thinking about this a lot. Excuse me. Sorry. Sure, I've been think thinking about fine. this quite, quite a bit. And I've been thinking about it since about 2019 when the American Psychological Association came out with some guidelines for, for clinicians who were working with boys and men. And this was a document that had some yeah, it was a mixed bag. It had some good points, but for the most part, it was more harm than good because it really damaged the trust that men have in psychologists. But maybe that's a separate piece of the discussion. But a foundational piece of that document was patriarchy. They didn't use the word over and over. They only used it a few times, but it was a foundational concept that we live in a patriarchal society that men benefit from and, and women suffer under. So use this word patriarchy in these guidelines but they never defined it. And I, I started to notice at that point that, yeah, I've been hearing this word for a long time, but I've never heard a definition of what patri patriarchy is. I mean, I've heard definitions, but but they're not specific. So I'll, I'll give you an example because um, I knew this question would come up when we talked today. So I, I started looking around on the web for a definition. What is, what is patriarchy? What is this thing that we keep talking about? And so I, the, here's here's a a sample of what I found that's very representative from a web website called Simply Psychology. And they have a, an article on there about what is patriarchy. And it's filled with a lot of really vague language. So I'll give you an example. Um, at one point, they say patriarchal relations structure both the private and public spheres with men dominating in public life and in their home. And they quote a paper that, that I'll refer to in a minute by Nash 2009. So we got we have this sentence here with a lot of terms that aren't defined. So patriarchal relations, what is that? What is a patriarchal relations? No one in the article does it say. An entire article filled with this kind of language, no definition of what a patriarchal relation is. It structures the private and public spheres. What does that mean? How exactly does this thing structure private and public spheres? It doesn't say. With men dominating in the public and private private home, uh, public life and in their home, dominating. What, what does that mean? It doesn't say. Nowhere is any of this defined. So we've got this whole article with this very vague, emotionally laden language. 
no definition of it. So uh, that particular sentence came from a paper in 2009 by someone named Nash. So I went and I looked up that paper and it was the same sort of thing. All of these assertions that are unsupported. So for example, from that Nash paper, here's a sentence about violence and how men use violence. Violence and its threat are understood as an attempt to diminish the power and resistance of women to men. Okay, and again, we could go through that sentence and we could pick out these terms that they're understood as an attempt. Well, who? Who understands it as an attempt? Who are we talking about? Diminishing the power. What does that man mean? Resistance of women to men. What does that mean? None of that's defined. The next sentence. This acceptance of men control, men's control of and violence to women has often been sanctioned by law. Who? Who, who is sanctioning violence against women? Now, there are societies where violence against women is, is sanctioned. There are societies where women cannot vote. There are societies where women are not allowed to show their face. These places exist, but these Western writers who talk about trade patriarchy, they're never talking about that. They're talking about Western society. So we have this assertion that the law sanctions violence against women, but we have no... I have no examples of how exactly that worked. The one, the one specific example that shows up repeatedly when people are talking about patriarchy is um, the the gender pay gap. And the way they arrive at the gender pay gap is by taking the average that all men make and comparing it to the average that all women make. That's not a way to look at numbers because because you if you only stop there then you you don't ask questions like, well, well why, is, why do these averages exist? If men make more money, which they do, there might be a reason for it. And those reasons are very easy to identify if you look beyond the average. Men work longer hours. They, um, they work harder, more difficult jobs than women. And, and they tend to spend more of their lives working. Now, one of the factors is that men tend not to take off a lot of time off for childbirth. And you could frame that, I, I suppose, as oppressive to women, but women are not required to have children and women can keep working if they want. So again, we, we have these really vague assertions. So I'm looking at this word patriarchy. Sorry, I'm getting long-winded here because I, I want to get to your question. What is patriarchy? And I think, well, well, patriarchy is obviously not something that anyone is really willing to define, even in the Barbie movie. Did you see the Barbie movie? Sure, yeah. I saw the Barbie movie, yeah. yeah. I like the movie. I, I liked it too. Like, yeah, it was fun. But they use this word patriarchy all the way throughout the movie. Nowhere they did, nowhere do they define it. Nowhere, not a single time do they say, okay, this is what patriarchy actually is. We're just supposed to accept that it's something that that hurts women, that women, that men do to women. Sort of like the APA guidelines. The APA guidelines and the Barbie movie were identical in that regard, in that they both rely on this concept that neither one of them defines. But at least the movie was entertaining. So, mm-hmm. so I'll give it that. So if patriarchy is this thing that no one is willing to pin down and define, then what is it exactly? Mm-hmm. And so I, I think that's where you have to turn to some behavioral principles. If you don't understand what the function of, if you don't understand why a creature is doing a thing, then look at the function, look at the outcome. You can determine the function of a behavior by examining its outcome. And when you look at the way people use the word patriarchy, there are some specific personal benefits. So if you're a graduate student in a psychology program, for example, you can use the word patriarchy. You go out and write a paper on patriarchy. You never have to define it. You never have to be specific about what you're talking about, but you can use this word and this implication that men are hurting women and you'll get an A on your paper. If you're a professor, you'll get some funding. If you're an institution, you will you will draw people to you. You will make yourself look better than other institutions if you talk about patriarchy more than other institutions that you're competing with. So it seems to me that patriarchy is a word that people use to climb some sort of of, um, social ladder. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that's, is that a, a, that was very long winded, but is that a fair definition of patriarchy? Maybe I've heard, I've heard you and maybe not you, you could say if this is not you and I miss misrepresenting, but I think I've, certainly other people, uh, people you've spoken to talk about a woman entering a man's frame in a relationship or a man, or, or maybe the opposite would that be like a mutual, you know, relationship where there's a symmetry, like an asymmetry in a relationship versus a symmetry. Do you think this idea of like a woman should enter a man's frame, would that be an example of a patriarchal assumption? Or is that's that, a, or is that a, not not irrelevant? Or is that like a different thing? Altogether? No, that's that's completely. I think that's completely irrelevant. Let me think about that for a second. That the the way frame is used in that regard that comes out of the red pill community. Mm-hmm. They didn't invent the frame. 
they didn't invent the concept of frame and frame would be, let's see if we can define it here. Frame would be somebody when two people come together, that one of them is going to enter and agree to the rules and the structure that of the other person's existence. So in, ther in psychology, for example, we talk about a therapeutic frame and the therapeutic frame is very important. When you go to a psychologist, you want there to be a strong therapeutic frame, which says, we're going to focus on your problem. We're going to do it between this time and this time. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot to that frame. And so the, the client is entering the psychologist frame, but it's understood that, that, and they're doing it voluntarily. And it's spelled out in, in the disclosure when you enter the relationship that this is how this relationship is going to work and it's for your benefit. When the red pill guys talk about frame, they're talking about sort of a similar, a similar way of viewing the, the, the term where when two people come together, man and a woman, could be two guys, you know, not to box people in, two women, but when two, when two people come together in a romantic relationship, one of them more than the other is going to enter the frame of the other person. So one of them is, is going to enter the world of that person and the relationship is going to define more by that person, the person establishing the frame, more by that person's um, their schedule, their way of doing things. One of them is going to wear the pants, so to speak. Um, whether it should be the man or the woman, I don't know. It's not, not for me to say. It, it seems to me that it's not for me to say what two people should do, but I can say that it seems to, I have noticed that relationships between men and women seem to go a little smoother when men assert themselves in relationships and when men ask for what they want. And when men, not that men need to rule over the woman, but women tend not to be very happy with men who are sort of spineless piles of jello. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, do you think of question? friendships in a similar way? Like I've, I've thank God I'm blessed to have a lot of friendships, you know, yeah. are friendships also an example of someone entering someone else's frame or is there like a mutuality there where it's just reciprocal? We're just friends. Well, I, th I think there's reciprocality there. And I also think that in romantic relationships, there's, there's reciprocality. Um, mm -hmm. If that's a word, I don't know if that's a word it is now. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, I think with friends, there's, there's, there's always going to be somebody who leads in this area and doesn't lead in that area. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so, and men are very good at, at, um, switching between hierarchies. So maybe on your bowling team, you're the captain, but you work with some of the same guys and you're a subordinate, you know, guys are pretty good at switching like that. Yeah. How do you think about love to change the subject a little bit here? Cause in the book is very interesting. Your book, you say, uh, it's like Voldemort, right? It's like that, the word that will not be named, uh, yeah. love. In Gatekeeper, I put love less. I, I, in Gatekeeper, a quick structure of the book, I talked about certain things that relationships should bring into a man. So there's composure, dignity, resilience, joy, and love. And I talk about the the inverse of those qualities that when the relationship is bringing in the inverse, like chaos and distraction and so forth, then you need to examine how that relationship is, is affecting your life. But of those five qualities, I put love last. And, and I, in the introduction, I joked and I said, I'm not going to use that word until we get to this last chapter because men are, are pretty sloppy about that word. And we get emotionally attached faster than women. And we declare love uh, more quickly than women. We get kind of possessive. We, we, we say that we love women. And that's been the fall of, of many men is considering love before they consider the practical implications of the practical aspects of, of a relationship. So that's why I put love last in the book. And as far as giving it a definition, cause you know, I, I like definitions and, and I talk a little bit about some different, some different ways of thinking of love, but my favorite definition comes from a, a professor I had in graduate school. And he talked about romantic love being when, well, love in general being when, I am as interested in in your success as I am in my own, which is a tough thing because usually if it's just people we know, just acquaintances and so forth, people that we don't love, we might be happy when they get that that raise or when they they surpass us in some way. But there's always that little that little conflicted neuron in the back of our head that says, yeah, I'm a little jealous of this too. But with love, that goes away. With love, I, I'm generally as interested in my wife's success, for example, as I am in my own. And then you throw sex into the mix and then you have romantic love.
Yeah. There's also a sense of like, um, I don't know if you agree or disagree with this, but from my perspective, the feeling of to be loved either by a, a child who might love you or a parent or by a spouse, a significant other is like an incredible, incredible joy. Like it's an incredible feeling of, uh, of wholeness and okayness, which is very, uh, there's like no, no comparison to that would be my, my perspective. You know, there's like a real, there's a, there's a prize to be had in, in a loving relationship. Uh, it could even be a loving friendship. I, I have friends that I, I would say I love them, you know, including guy friends. I mean, specifically guy friends, actually. I wouldn't say that to a female friend. Um, certainly guy friends that I love. And um, I just feel like when we think of like the the elements of life that like make life worth living, that are worth protecting, right? To me, that just feels like like such a centerpiece of of, of like uh, contentment and and like and, and like goodness in my life. Do, do you feel that way also or no? Yeah, I, th I think we're social creatures and, and different people have different levels of need, but we all need to be around people to some degree. And, you know, most people want that, that significant connection where you know that someone else is actually invested in you. Someone actually, actually cares about what happens to you. Yeah. Do you ever, do you ever see people who like, um, fail, failure to thrive or like incels or, you know, do you, do you ever think about the incel phenomenon at all? Is that something you, that you've thought about? A little bit, you know, I, I don't, I don't tend to find those people in my practice because guys that have no interest in romantic relations or more specific to incels, I should be more accurate that, that they feel like they can't participate in that. Um, they don't tend to really find their way to my office. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I do have a lot of empathy for those guys. I don't think it's a new thing. There's been some interesting research by, particularly by a, a young researcher named Costello and he's really done some excellent work looking at who are these guys. And I say guys specifically, because we're talking about a, a subset of the male population who thinks that they will never be able to have this thing that we're talking about. This is this connection, love, relationships. And he, you know, before he really started looking at this, at who these guys are by actually going out and talking to them, there was this media impression that, that was out there, that these guys are violent, that they're mass shooters, that they're, they're horrible people, that they're all right-wing extremists. So he's gone out and actually talked to them and found out some really interesting things about them that on average, politically, they're, they're not, um, they're not right-wing extremists on average. They're, they're a little bit left of center. The ones who do endorse violence tend to endorse more right-wing, um, more right-wing viewpoints, but even they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're not right-wing nutcases that, um, they're very high in depression and um, I don't know what words we can say here and not anger the the algorithm, but um, they're high in depression and um, self-cancellation ideas repeatedly um, that, that occur to them throughout the week that they... You mean like um, misogyny have, and homophobia or am I missing well, something? They, they think about suicide. Okay, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we can yeah, move to that. I'm sure. to yeah. say that <laughs> we're yeah. here and, and not yeah. have the algorithm. Self-cancellation, I got it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, that the, they're kind of, you know, they're average guys who are, who are pretty depressed. Mm -hmm. They're, they're pretty um, self-critical. They're, they're angry. They're a little bit misogynistic. They have a little bit of a, a victim mentality going on, but they're not these freaks that we've been hearing about. And so anyway, I, I don't think that incels are particularly new phenomena. I think that uh, we know that throughout history, only a certain percentage of men actually pass on their genes, which says that there have been involuntary celibates throughout human history mm -hmm. yeah. and we're just now starting to look at it yeah what are some red flags we talk about red flags what are the red flags to worry about if we're if we're trying to be a good gatekeeper and and protect our our ourselves and our and our castle so to speak yeah that's a, a that's a great question because i i think about red flags a little differently than some people do i think it's important to know it's important to know the red flags so for example a woman who uh, cannot contain her emotions and, and gets a little violent, obvious red flags. And, but it's worth pointing out because men will stay with women who are violent, but it's, it's a red flag. It's something that you should avoid. And there are lists of red flags out there and some of them are good and some of them are a little bit nutty. The thing about red flag lists is that they only carry you so far. You could memorize 50 red flags and then someone blindsides you with number 51 that you never anticipated. And so red flag lists are necessary, but they're not sufficient. 
And I tend to think in terms of, okay, what are you looking for? What are you looking for in a woman? What are you looking for in a relationship? What are you looking for in yourself? Because presumably, if you want to be in a relationship with a woman, there's something that you want to achieve. Maybe you want family. Maybe you just want that companion by your side. But if you don't know what you're looking for, then you're much more likely to fall into the red flag traps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm trying to think here. Sometimes, sometimes I, I feel like there's different directions to take the conversation. And so I, I get, yeah. you know, I, I take a second to pause on my end. Um, is it hard for men to find a woman that sort of clear all those hurdles? You, you have a, this idea of a bright triad of, of a woman who sort of checks all the boxes and doesn't have the red flags and doesn't in, encroach on any of the boundaries in your experience, in your clinical experience, you feel like men struggle to find those women. I think some men struggle more than others for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, I, th I think that there are a lot of guys out there who never really have to think much about this stuff because they come, they're lucky. They come from an intact, stable family. They had great role models of, of parents who handled conflict well. They had just enough conflict so that the kid could see them resolving conflict, for example. They, um, they had good relationships with both of their parents. And then these guys get kind of lucky and they they meet a woman who sort of fits into that nice paradigm that they were taught. So, so the good relationships just continue and um, it helps to have a good uh, community. And, and so that it's easier to meet people. So some guys really don't struggle at all. They go from a great family to a great relationship and they, that's great. Good for them. Cause then they just continue the good vibes through the generations, hopefully. But then there are other guys who for a variety of reasons, um, not the least of which is that guys in general are less physically attractive than women. We're, we're kind of ugly compared to them on average. And so if you have a guy who's particularly good looking, he's going to be, he's going to have a lot more luck than the average guy who's, you know, his, his genetic lottery was maybe he's smart or maybe he's real capable in some, some area, but he's, he's, it's harder for him to draw attention. So he has to develop his social skills. For example, other guys come from so, so it's harder for that guy maybe to meet women and get the relationship going. Other guys come from backgrounds where they just have this pattern of unhealthy relationships. And so when they meet someone out there who is familiar, even if she's very unhealthy and then the interactions are unhealthy, if she's familiar, he's likely to go for that just because our brains prize familiarity. And so he's going to go through a series of, of miserable relationships there's all kinds of factors, but in general, I'd say, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard. It's a challenge for most people. Mm -hmm. When I look at the relationships around me that failed, you can, I mean, if there's a lot, I don't know, obviously you never really know from as an outsider, but you could, you could talk to some people, get some information. Um, so there's obviously a lot of unknown. There's obviously a lot of variety, but a lot of them seem to be like, just the guy is just not responsive or attuned to the needs of his wife or the guy has some sort of addiction problem or the guy is not you know able to communicate properly and you know um do, do you feel like uh women also have to be very careful about the kind of guys they let let into their life for for similar oh, reasons 100 percent. Yeah. yeah and i've got a daughter so i think quite quite a bit of, i think a lot that, about that quite a bit is what, what kind of guys she's gonna choose and hopefully she does well but yeah the risk for women choosing the wrong guy you know it's 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 very high um it's high in the sense that men are bigger and stronger and, and if she chooses someone who happens to be violent she's, she's going to be in trouble it's it's risky in the sense that women have a shorter reproductive timeline than we do so if she's interested in having children and she devotes a lot of years to the wrong guy you know she may be closing that window on herself like it is not a trivial thing for women yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just worried, like when I, when I read the book, a lot of it felt like, um, an ability, a willingness to disqualify sort of on technicalities. I don't know. I don't know if that wasn't maybe my miss, maybe you don't feel like that's a correct interpretation of the book or misreading or something, which is fair. But I felt like, you know, if, if my wife or, or the people that I've been in relationships with were like, were sort of, you know, worried about like my, my parents, for example, or whether or not I leave things on the floor or whether or not I, I, make a, a, a ask my spouse to you know spend more time with me when she maybe wants to not you know wants to be out in the world doing her hobby like there's a risk of like disqualifying people on like little things um mm -hmm. 
it, we sort of risk being left alone, right? Like if, if everyone's sort of raising their bar, men and women are, are being more and more and more selective and, and disqualifying on, on what feels a little bit like technicalities, isn't there a danger that we'll just, we'll just be alone? Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't think that was my intent, but I can see where you got it. I don't think that was a, I don't think that was you um, misreading the book necessarily because I, I am, you know, I, I do recommend that men in general raise their standards for the women that they allow into your life. And that means ruling a lot of people out. And hopefully it's not on technicalities. Hopefully it's more on values based things. So, so if a person is throwing their clothes around and you don't really care, then who cares? You know, it's, it's not an issue, but if it conflicts with your values, like, like it's very important for you to have order in your environment because that's the only way you can really function. And this person cannot get themselves to, to pick their clothes up off the floor, then you're signing up for a lifetime of really being challenged. And yeah, maybe that's something you're willing to do. And maybe, maybe the benefits outweigh the risks with this person, but it's something to think about. And, and my experience with guys is that we don't think enough about those things. Mm-hmm. But, but as far as you misreading the book, no, I don't know that you misread it. Um, I, Cause nope. I do talk about disqualifying people. Yeah. Um, I want to share a quote from the book that, that I like. I feel like this is a, a quote which we it, it sort of comes back to. It's it's fairly on early on in the book. Maybe give people a sense. Um, this is talking about in the context of like rites of passage, of what it means to be a man of purpose, what it means. This is in the part of the book where you're talking about what it, what it means to have a purpose in life and, and, and do a good job and, and be sort of successful. Um, and you mentioned at this point in the book that like in the past, we had like rites of passage associated with becoming a man. Um, and, and today we don't have those for the most part. And you talk about the importance of prestige, and this is the quote. So it says, once we gain prestige, we can easily lose it. This idea, man cards are revocable. All you have to do is get soft and rest on your laurels. Stop producing publicly verifiable demonstrations of effectiveness before retirement age, and suddenly people murmur about your worth. Men can opt out of this expectation. Any man can be lazy and entitled, and he will survive. Um, He will simply be considered less than masculine. Men of purpose will disregard him and his romantic prospects will decline. Can you, can you speak to that sort of what it means to be a man of purpose and uh, man card and, and things like that? Yeah, I spent quite a bit of time in Gatekeeper and, and a little bit of time in the Tactical Guide to Women talking about having yourself squared away before, as a man, before you try to get into a relationship because like it or not, you know, I don't, I don't make the rules here. I'm just, you know, I just report the news it seems to be the case that societies don't think very highly of men who don't consistently give more than they take. Because if all, I mean, think about what would happen if all the men in the world took more than they were giving, the world would fall apart. Um, and women, it's I'm just going to factor women out of this for, for a minute. Let's just talk about men operating in the world. And so there's this expectation that as a man, you're going to produce something. You're going to do something useful with your life. Um, I don't, I don't know. Would you, would you agree with that? Is that what you see in the world? Um, I think what, what I see is, is, um, a, a kind of judgment towards other men that I don't, that doesn't resonate with me. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't worry about my man card and I don't worry about other people's man cards, but I feel like some people do. You know, I, when I was young, I, I was, I was bullied. I, I remember I, I thank you. you I, I'm doing great now and it's been a long time. So it feels like a past lifetime. But when I was young, you know, I remember in high school, kids would call me gay um, and things like that. And what they were telling me is like, I didn't have a man card, you know, that my romantic prospects weren't going to be there for me. You know, I wonder what they, what they were, what were they referring to specifically? Well, I was, I was probably a soft kid. Now, now I'm athletic. And I think that inspired me to become a wrestler and, and become athletic and go to the okay. gym and, you know, but at the time I wasn't. And, so, and so they were just looking at they they were looking at you and they were judging you to be physically soft and that's what led to this level. also socially I was awkward you know okay. um but I think I think that there's a there's a tendency in boys to police manliness yeah you know um and and when I think about patriarchy I think about that more than anything else I think it's about boys telling other boys what it means to be a man you know and and to me I wonder if those definitions tend to be very rigid. And um, t- now I, I'm very masculine. I check all the boxes, you know, I'm an athlete or whatever, or I'm, I'm not so much now, but I was in college, let's say. Um, but but my friends didn't have to be. And and, and to me, their, their man card wasn't in question. And so I, 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 I've worked good jobs where I made good money. And now 
I don't make such good money and my, my wife makes more money than me. And um, I have friends who don't make money. And to me, their, their man card isn't in question, you know, but for some people it is. And I think that's an interesting distinction. Yeah, that's really interesting. I would not thought about um, patriarchy being men policing each other. I think there's probably something to that. Yeah. Um, another, another piece of the book is, is this idea of being whipped. You even have a word in there, pussy whipped. You said, you, you know, you, you heard it from your father. Um, there's, there's a sense of, uh, losing, losing your, your masculinity in a relationship. Can, can you talk to that a little bit? Like what, what's the danger there? The danger of being whipped. And, and yeah, I did use the word pussy whipped, not as a clinician. I just said, this is, you know, this is a condition that my father would have called pussy whipped mm -hmm. where, where a man goes home and, um, he's mistreated essentially. He's nagged, he's berated, he's he's kind of talked down to. All of his possessions are relegated to the man cave and the main floor is just, you know, the living room was floral plants and prints and throw pills is a very feminine space. And there's there's not much room for him in, in the relationship. And um, my father would have called that pussy whipped. I guess among my friends, I would call that pussy whipped. As a clinician, what I think of is here's somebody in a relationship, forget that it's the man and the woman. Here's somebody in the relationship who has been relegated to second place, no longer, no longer an equal footing with their partner. When somebody's somebody's when one person is nagging the other person, berating the other person, treating the other person like a child, relegating their positions to a their possessions to a separate room in the house, that that person has really lost the respect or maybe never had the respect of the other person. And when I certainly see men doing this to women, but I see it frequently men, men being um, berated and nagged and belittled by their women. And since this is a book for men, that's what I wrote about. And it's not a comfortable position for either party you know, I, you know, I've been married for a long time. I would not, I, I, I'd be very unhappy if my wife felt that I was constantly on her, constantly talking down to her, you know, made her put her stuff somewhere else because I don't want to see it, you know, that sort of thing. I would not respect her if she allowed herself to be in that position. And I would not feel good about myself for putting her in that position. And I think that's a, a more nuanced way of thinking about what my father would have called pussy whipped. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on that? It's interesting. I think I, I, I see the shame there. You know, I see, yeah, I see shame, that shame, yes. you know, if someone came to me and he says, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm worried that I'm pussy whipped. You know, I, I would want to know, like, like, where did you, you know, like, are, are you happy? Are your needs being met? Are you in a loving relationship? Can you communicate your, your needs better and say like, it's, you know, mm -hmm. but but what comes up in, in that word and what comes up in general when um, there's a sense of being domesticated, it's it, it feels like that the man card question again. You know, are you a real man? Like a real man wouldn't be pussy whipped. A real man. You know, there was another one in there. Uh, you, 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 there's a throwaway word of a cuck. You know, like animals, you say in the book that, you know, one animal will, will, will be a cuck and raise another animal's children. You know, and some women try to take advantage of men that way. And again, there's this there's this deep anxiety and shame that I think men carry with them. I think from fathers who are abusive and from experiences of being bullied of like, am I a real man? You know, do I have a a man card? And I feel like that intr intrudes into relationships sometimes where mm -hmm. man begins to feel self. Am I being pussy whipped? You know, um, am I being cucked because maybe the girl that I love has children or something like that? And I feel like that's a danger to relationships. Wait, sorry, which part is the danger? The the man, the shame, fear of being... carrying that shame with you, carrying that fear yeah. with you. Whereas, whereas obviously all relationships require communication and expression of you know if if a wife is being unfair, that needs to be resolved, and, and you should definitely speak up for yourself. But um, but I feel like that shame can be very toxic, or that okay. that fear of of not being a real man, if that's sort of where it's coming from, that could be a toxic, uh, in, you know, effect in the relationship. Yeah, I think it can definitely, shame is is definitely destructive to relationships. And um, here's the way I think about, about shame. I think about it from an evolutionary perspective, and, and I won't go into a whole thing about it. But basically, shame is meant to close you down. It's an adaption, adaptive behavior that we have that says, okay, people are people are upset with me right now. I'm going to cool my jets, shut up, sit down, be quiet. 
so that I can think about what I'm doing here and I can get myself back into the good graces of people. And that's, that's an adaptive thing up to a point, but when it starts driving your behavior and there is no answer to that question, what can I do differently? I'm just broken. I'm just flawed. Then that's the kind of shame that really just shuts a guy down. Mm. And I want to back up for a minute and talk about this, this notion of being pussy whipped. I've worked with a lot of couples over the years. And I don't, I don't, I, I'm very careful about going into couples with perceived preconceived notions. Of course, I have my preconceived notions. As a clinician, I'm supposed to be aware of them, set them aside. So I, I just, the only reason I'm saying that is I don't, I don't want to give the impression that I'm approaching couples that I work with, with this, these notions of man card and shame and so forth, you know, these assumptions that men are coming in with all of these things. I have seen, having said all that, I've seen many relationships when, where the men are um, being shamed into compliance where they're quiet, where they're small. And invariably when a guy is what my father would have called pussy whipped, the woman resents the hell out of him. And it has nothing to do with him not being a real man. It has to do with him showing, showing up or not showing up in the relationship. Women tend to be happier because they're very relational creatures on, on average. They tend to be happier when we actually show up and, and, even when it means that we're disagreeing with them, most healthy women prefer a man who will disagree with them rather than just say, yes, dear, because now he's, when he does that, he's just disengaged. And that that's not a very rewarding relationship for the woman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Okay. I can ask you a question. If you, Go ahead. Yeah. I love want. that. You're all, I'm an open book. Yeah. I love to. Okay. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's, it's your video. I don't need to tell you this, but edit, edit it out if I get too. Sure, prior. no, yeah, I, I tend I'm, to. Yeah, I'm very, I'm curious. I tend to. Please, so I love it. You, you mentioned that you're married. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that at the moment your your wife makes more money than you. Um, would you say that? What's your sense of what your wife prefers in terms of you showing up? Is is your wife comfortable with you disagreeing with her? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's important that there's that mutuality in in terms of the ability to show up. I think what characterizes our relationship is a sense that we're, we're able to succeed together because we're both okay on our own. And I think that's very rare. I think it's hard to find that in a lot of people. Um, I think that people who go to a relationship because they're, they need the other person to complete them because, you know, they, they feel desperate. And I get, if we think about like the incel, the sense of like the women have a need that they have, that they have a need that only a woman can fill. I think that's that's a recipe for a kind of unhealthy relationship. I think for us, um, there's a, there's a mutuality there. There's a there's a confidence that both of us share, and a mutual respect and and love, of course. Um, and so I think yeah, I think I think we're comfortable expressing our needs. You know, so if I leave stuff lying around, you know, she can complain, and I'm okay with it, and I'm not afraid of that being you know my man card being in question because I'm you know responsive to her needs and mm -hmm. vice versa. Um, and I think the other the other piece to think of my relationship is this. We were married. We were like I, I was 21 and she was 20. So we were children when we got married, literal children. Mm -hmm. And in our relationship, I think in all relationships, people change and evolve and grow. And I think all relationships go through hard times and all relationships go through struggles. And I think that um, a lot of people call it quits as soon as struggle happens. But I think there could also be, and that, that might be the right move. There's nothing wrong with calling it quits. There's no shame in calling it quits. That's totally fine and often the right the way to go. But often I think there's a value, there's there's a reward to be had by getting through those hard times, you know, by working through those yeah. issues. You know, that's sort of been my experience. Yeah, absolutely. You master what you practice. And if what you practice is working through problems, then you're going to get good at that. You know, just like you practice playing the piano, you're going to get good at the piano. So, yeah. And um, I'm, I'm curious if you don't mind me asking about your relationships, you, you got married pretty young. Very young. And yeah. the fact that you're still doing okay leads me to believe that your values were aligned and probably remained aligned. Is that, is that true? Yeah, I think that's true. I think a large part of that is that we, we respect each other and are able to learn from each other, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, which again is, is hard for people, especially for men. I think men often think of themselves as like super rational and women is irrational. I think of men who, um, yeah, just, just often, yeah, yes, yeah, see, see, are, are very afraid of like, they, they use terms like a monkey branching and, and they're very fearful that women are using them or stepping on them. And, and I think that that, that mentality just, just sort of makes thinking 
long term, you know, thinking broadly instead of thinking about, you know, glass half empty, what what I don't have right now, think about all the things you do have. And, and you know, so so, yeah, to answer your question, I would say, yes, our values have, have, have been more or less aligned, even though we've evolved. And part of the way in which we've been able to evolve together is because we see a relationship as a mutual project of growth. You know, it's there's a mutual uh, evolution that we're embarking on. And that, you know, there'll be times of more divergence and less divergence, but it's ultimately, that's part of the project, you know? Yeah. And you mentioned in there, um, th this assumption that women are more irrational. Is that, is that what you That's said? not my assumption, but that's the no, assumption no, no, I hear no. from men. Yeah. I hear that a lot yeah. from men. You know, I hear, I hear a kind of a fear that women are using them translating into a disdain, disdainful remarks about women. Like, for example, they're very irrational. So like you have like Rolo Tomasi, the rational male, um, and that red pill community is, I think, filled with with kind of rhetoric around, uh, you know, di again, bi uh, biological differences between the sexes, which are used to explain why, you know, women are, are are constantly looking elsewhere in the relationship and things like that, which which to me speaks to that shame that men feel, that, that fear of not being a real man, of being used being by a woman or being cucked, you know, that I think I think ultimately that fear and, you know, will translate into making sure the woman... Uh, is very subservient in many cases, right? If I'm afraid that I'm being used, if I'm afraid that I'm pussy whipped, some people could shut down from that shame. But I think a more common response is to make sure the woman is 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 a uh, is 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 subservient to you. You know, yeah. So that's what I worry about. Yeah, that red pill space is really interesting, and I notice the same generalizations. I try to keep my ear to the ground. I've met a lot of these red pill guys. I've met Rolo in person a couple of times. I'm pretty sure he hates my gut. Um, and I, I notice some of the same things when they use words like monkey branching it's very fear-based you know they've taken this concept from evolutionary psychology that has really fallen out of favor with evolutionary psychologists because the evolutionary psychologists they're the evolutionary psychologists are an interesting crew because they look at things very dispassionately and they're unlike other areas of psychology where they're willing to say things they're willing to just say what they see in differences between men and women which is unusual in my profession but They've, you know, a long time ago, guys, guys like David Buss and so forth had this idea of dual mating, dual mating theory or dual, uh, I'm going to call it dual mating. I think that's not quite the wrong term, which implied that women, um, they look for different kinds of men. They look for the alpha and they look for the beta. They, they look for the guy that has the good, the good genes. And then they look for the guy who will who will provide. And there's, there's a little bit of truth that they proposed this theory a long time ago. And then somewhere along the way, they said, no, you know, that really doesn't hold water. We're not seeing much evidence for, you know, ov ovulatory shift and dual mating hypothesis. So we're, we're going to, we're turning more toward mutual mate choice, which is, which is more what uh, evolutionary psychologists are looking at today and seems to make a lot more sense. But the red pill guys have latched onto this, this arcane theory from 20 years ago that has fallen out of favor and they've they've held on to it, and it leads them to things th these fear based responses, or maybe the fear based responses lead them to the theories. Mm -hmm. But you know, like the idea of monkey branching being that a woman is sort of like a shark moving through the water, always looking for the next meal. So they grab onto one guy, and then but they're looking for the next better option. And then when soon as they find the next better option, they'll grab onto him. And then they'll let go of the first guy. And it's it's all very fear-based. It's, it's really a misunderstanding of human nature and women. Um, and so I, I guess my point here being that when you hear, or at least when I hear men generalizing about women, I always ask myself the question, well, which women are they talking about? Because a lot of these red pill guys seem to be talking about their personal experiences with women, which have been painful and unfortunate, they they seem to be unable to separate that from women in general. And so their experience becomes their template for all women everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think, yeah, when I think about that, I think, I just think there's this, this path that people go down. And when I think about the incel character, I think about someone who feels that they have needs that can only be met by a woman, um, which are probably a need for love, certainly a need for sex, they might say. Uh, companionship and and they they uh, they just build resentment, which deepens them in the cycle of resentment and 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 a lack of uh, the tools that could potentially create the kind of relationships that might fill that need, you know. Um, yeah, 
Um, what what's your understanding of incels? Yeah, so I think I think this idea that so so the, yeah, I have, I have a lot of thoughts about incels. I think I know some incels. I mean, they haven't like came out to me and said I'm an incel, but I I, I see them, I talk to them, I hear the way they talk, and I and I look at the the relationship life. I, I feel like this, this these guys are probably in the community. Um, there's there's the sense of I I feel sad and empty, and the only way to to make that better is is a woman to to love me for example, or to have sex with me or whatever the case may be. And I don't think, I don't think that's, that's a template that's healthy. I don't think that's accurate. I think that what they would find if they were to get a woman is that even in a relationship, they would be unhelp, unha unhappy because the, the woman wouldn't be totally subservient to them. The woman wouldn't be sexually available whenever they wanted sex. A woman wouldn't be loving whenever they wanted or felt they needed love. That there's a hole inside them that is the issue ultimately. And the externalization of that hole is very damaging. That's that's sort of my main understanding of it. The externalization uh, being what? The only way I'll feel okay is if a okay. woman serves us my needs. Okay. Whereas t to me, the best way to have a woman service your needs and to have a good relationship with a woman is to be okay internally. It's a, it's a reversal of like cause and effect. Okay. So when you think about involuntary celibates, you're thinking of guys who have kind of hostile attitudes toward women. Which is yes. um, not far from, and that's one of the things that people like William Costello have found is, is that there is this sense of being victimized and having some hostility toward women. That's that's the thing that stands out to you. Yeah, um, but you, you you would probably argue there's more diversity in that community, which might be true. Which might be true. I'm just speaking from I, maybe I don't know a, a narrow. Yeah. yeah. An another piece is this. I think we talked a little bit about the what the way in which men police what it means to be a man, in which we, we police mm -hmm. our men card and and different people police more aggressively and less aggressively. You know, uh, the most comic book ridiculous character is Andrew Tate, you know, who's like the this this over the top ridiculous red pill kind of character. But but he has this very strong notions of what it means to be a man and drive a Lamborghini and, you know, be mm -hmm. a kickboxer and all these things. Part of what it goes into that policing is a sense that to be a real man, you have to have a conventionally attractive woman. You know, so like, for example, you read about Elliot Rogers. So he was a, a, a terrorist. He was an incel. He wrote like a hundred page manifesto, might be less than that, but a really long manifesto about his life and his biography, autobiography. And he was obsessed. He was so shy. He had no friends. No one would talk to him, but he was obsessed with the sorority girls, the hot sorority girls in his college. That was what he's obsessed with. He hated the sorority girls because this idea to be a real man is to get the hottest girls. And in patriarchy, we police that like, like when, um, you know, when we tell someone you're, you're not a real man or, or you're not going to be attractive with women, we mean like the hottest women. When uh, I think that's such a, a an awful thing to tell people because of course men exist on a bell curve, on a spectrum, as do women. There are men who are attractive and less attractive. There are men who are more neurotypical and more neurodivergent. And there are women who are more and less attractive. W women who are overweight. With part of the red pill is a disdain, a real hatred for women who aren't conventionally attractive. Uh, in my experience, a disdain for women who are, you know, maybe on the spectrum or not neurotypical. And it's, I think that, that hate also, also homophobia. Um, and I think these, these cut out the opportunity for, for relationships for a lot of men. And I feel like these, uh, not just with women, but even friendships in general, um, it, it, it creates a sense where men are uh, alexithymic. They're not in touch with their emotions. They can't, they can't speak to their own emotional needs, you know? So that's sort of what I see when I see incels, people who have a narrow perspective on what they want and what they need. And a lot of that I see as being conditioned by patriarchy. How would you define, well, I, okay, I got to get order my thoughts here because you said something interesting that I want to come back to. You you talked about, you, you alluded to this conflict, or at least that's what I saw, this conflict where someone like Elliot Rogers is obsessed with the hot women on campus while simultaneously hating them. And that's something right. that I see in the red pill community. And I think that's what leads people to say um, that the red pill community is the male equivalent of feminism because feminism sort of I idealizes men and hates men, at least the, the, the real feminist ideologues out there. And I think that when you're, man, if you're that conflicted about the opposite sex, that's something you got to get sorted out before you even think about having a relationship, you know, like idealizing someone and hating them at the same time. And that that's, it's common, but you can't have a relationship when you're in that, in that mental state, at least not one that's going to function well. But um, so anyway, you can set that aside. I'm curious what your definition of patriarchy is. I think it's policing gender roles. I think it's the idea okay. that men have a certain role, which is to, you know, be out in the world and be a provider. And a woman have a certain role, which is to take care of the the home. 
for example. And that, that's a big piece of it. And the idea that man should be masculine and manly and that a woman should be like your soft pillow when you come home from a from the busy work day of the world is all hard and whatever. And the woman is your comfort blanket and she makes you feel better. And she gives you a bowl of soup and gives you a hug and says, I'm so happy to see you. You know, it's this policing and, and um, it's, you know, men should be tough and stoic and women should be uh, emotionally uh, comforting to men. That's okay. sort of I see, a policing of, of what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. You know, woman, this is also yeah. the asymmetry and sexual uh, double standards. So like, you know, a man is, is entitled and is okay to sleep with a lot of women, but a woman who sleeps around is a slut, you know? Um, and there's, you know, slush shaming, you know, this police that men, you know, women, only women who are pretty are, are, are like, are, are valued as women. And anyone who's like unpretty, if you put an overweight woman on a magazine cover, that's, you know, that's a tyranny or something, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah. I, I think that's a really interesting definition of patriarchy. I have to think about that it because it, it's not it's connected to this idea that men are oppressing women, but it's not dependent on that idea necessarily. You're talking about enforcing gender yeah. roles. I Some think, that I comes think from, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. You go first. No, I'll hold my thought. What were you going to say? Sorry, I was going to say, I think men suffer under patriarchy. That's my belief. My belief is that, that the bullying, Elliot Rogers was bullied by men. Men, he writes in his biography, his autobiography, and men like put his head in a toilet or, you know, smash his head into a desk. Like he was bullied by men. You know, he's he's a victim of patriarchy in my experience. Men being mean to him because he wasn't masculine enough. He didn't look like a real man. You know, that's okay. how I that's how I see it. So then I would I would argue I'm the devil's advocate here. Actually, no, I'm, I'm kind of disagreeing or kind of agreeing with you that if if patriarchy is the enforcement of gender roles, then women would be just as guilty of it as men because, for example, uh, slut shaming. I'm not going to be able to, to back this up with, with any studies or data. Yeah, women but do it. That of course, comes more absolutely. from women than men. There, there's a I great um, account on Twitter. It's a parody account. It's a character named Wei Wu. And she's a she's in this parody account. She is a, I think she's from China. This this mythical person is from China. And she's her whole shtick is she's constantly slut shaming Western women. And I think that the parody there is it's a parody of women slut shaming each other. And it, the reason satire and parody works, satire and parody only works when there's some truth to it. A hundred percent. A hundred. There's no, there's no question in my mind that the, the enforcement of gender roles, anyone can do that. Absolutely. Women do it too. A hundred percent. And so I, women, there, women will tell you. Yeah. Would you say there, is there any value in enforcing gender roles? Yeah, I think in, I, there's a cost. I would say there's a cost. To feminism. I, th I understand feminism as the rejection of gender roles. And of course there's a cost. That's right. And that's interesting. Hang on. Hang on. I gotta write that down. Okay. Go ahead. I'm, I'm just making those yeah. for myself. Sure. I, and, and there's, there's real cost uh, to that, there, there, you know, and, and there's going to be winners and losers. Um, just like, you, you know, um, again, and the red pool, the red pool, I think is, is right about some of these points. For example, they talk about birth control and, and the way in which sex is the, the, the economy around sex has changed and 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 women need men less so i think for a lot of cases of social progress for example when you give women the right to vote and when we um say that uh you know women can join the workforce and they're no longer fully dependent on men um that's a, these, these are these are moral progress this is moral progress that we should be proud of but there's going to be uh, also winners and losers on the margins, you know, um, because the economy around sex and relationships change and we should be empathetic to that and, um, you know, aware of that, but not, not try to roll back. I think what the ultimate good is, which is freedom, the freedom to, for a woman to become a, a scientist if she wants, which is, wasn't possible 50, 60 years ago, but now it is, you know, um, or maybe it was, but it was, was less common for sure. So, that would be my point. So there's definitely costs, I would say, and and definitely people suffer and find find the 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 relationship world harder as a result. As a and result of 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 a breaking down of gender roles, right? Sure. Yeah. And even general, maybe maybe even in general relationships, in some sense, certainly for men, are going to be harder if if the rigid if the if the roles aren't as clearly defined. You know, uh, who does what? The man earns, the woman cleans. There's, mm -hmm. I think there's a comfort, there's a safety, there's a security in having rigid gender roles. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a, a cost and benefit in, in sort of moving beyond them. That's how I see it. Yeah. One of the things I've seen over the years in my, in my practice in various couples is when a man stops performing, he stops earning, he stops, uh, you know, he stops 
a, a lot of times money is the proxy for the discussion, but but money being a reflection of a guy stopped, no, no longer performing in the world. He's losing his social connections. He's losing his influence in the, in the community. He's planting himself in front of a game console that women in general, really wives in general, really lose respect for husbands that stop performing. Now you mentioned earlier that that at this point in your career, your make your wife is making more money than you. But I see you as a guy, you know, just my my brief interaction with you, somebody who's out in the world developing, you know, you know establishing connections and, and having an influence, having an important conversation. So my guess would be that even though you're not making as much money as you right now, my guess would be that she doesn't see you as somebody who's not performing. I but think I think she, there's a lot of there's a lot of variation you'll find. If this is going back to the sense in which women are absolutely um, a part of of policing of gender roles, and there are a mm -hmm. lot of women who I think would not respect their husband if if he was in my shoes, you know, not not earning the way I have been or could be or she is earning. And um, I think that's that could be fine. I think that could also be considered a shame. Um, I I was lucky. I I happened to have chose a woman who is more I think broad minded in that respect. Where I, I might say to her, I say, my wife, you know, I'm beginning to feel a little shame. You know, I'll tell her, you know, I, am I am I not living up to my role as a man um, because I'm not providing? And she'll say, would I not be living up to my role as a woman if I was watching the kids and you were out working? No, she, that's what she would say to me. She said this to me multiple times. You know, I, why why would I have to feel ashamed if that was the, the, the case? So since it's reversed now, why should you feel ashamed? And so that's unique to her. That's her embrace of, uh, I would say, feminism and a rejection of gender roles. Not everyone is in that position. A lot of people, I think, do imbi have imbibed and have absorbed a sense of gender roles. And in that case, they would give me a different answer. They would say, yeah, I, I am losing respect for you and you probably should get out in the workforce. And so that variety exists. And so I feel blessed and lucky to be in a place where I can endorse the relaxing of gender roles because it, it works well for me and, 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 and encourage people to sort of move slowly in that direction. Um, but of course, not everyone is there. And that, that, so that will play out differently in different relationships. That's how yeah. I see it. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me, and I don't know what to make of this, you know, and I don't want to get too much into your to your um, marriage here. So, tell I'm me an open book. I love it. Any question, okay. if it, if it's out of bounds, I'll edit it out. But well, there's it's, nothing it's out of bounds. <laughs> okay, thank you. It's, it's just yeah. interesting to me that even though, even in the in the situation that you're in, you're still displaying accountability by going to her and saying, "Hey." Am, am I letting you down here? Yeah. That, that's what I heard. You know, yeah, I feel like yeah, I'm not, totally. you're still displaying that masculine accountability. I, accountability is not a masculine trait, but it is something that I think if we're talking about gender roles, it's something that's expected of us is accountability. You're, you're still showing it. Yeah. And I wonder if that's, yeah, I wonder if that's I'm, I'm a child of patriarchy and it's, you know, and, and I think, I think what a lot of feminists do is they want to imagine a future where we move beyond it, but we're not in that future, you know? And I think all men and women, um, to, to varying degrees are, are subject to this uh, expectations about gender roles. And that could be an issue in a relationship, for example, like mine, where if a man is not working, that could be a real problem in a relationship because the man and the woman have expectations about gender roles, you know, for sure. But uh, it, there's a utopian feminist line of thought, which says we'll go to a future where, you know, half the, half the relationships will have the woman as the primary breadwinner and the man will raise the children and half the relationships, relationships will be the opposite. And that'll be fine. There might be some costs. There might not be might not be a utopia. There might be other issues in the society that arise because of that. But but that's something we can imagine. You know, we don't have to have strict division of labor the way we currently do. Do you think that's possible? Well, I think we've moved in that direction a lot. I think if we compare us to the 1950s, 1940s, we're we're like we're like largely there. I mean, back in the day, women weren't in the workforce at all, and you know now women are are doing much better than men when it comes to high level degrees and doctors and things like that. You know, so. Um, I, I feel like we are moving in that direction. To what extent is it going to be utopian? To what extent is it going to be a 50-50 split? Probably won't be, because I believe men and women are different, you know, as the red pill will tell you, and, and you know, as evolutionary psychology will tell you. I think that men and women do have different brains, you know? So it doesn't have to be a 50-50 split, but the goal, I think, is, is the freedom for individuals to do what they want as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we are definitely in a different place than we were in the 50s, and I don't know. Maybe we've reached the point. Maybe we've reached the utopian. There, there is no going further because yeah. as you say, there, there's men and women are different. They have different expectations. And in general, you know, it, 
if, if you want to talk about evolutionary psychology, is it's pretty well established that women generally across cultures throughout time, they look for certain things in men. They look for the the ability to provide and, and the willingness to stick around. These are the these are two things that women tend to really look for in men. It's 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 kind of indisputable. I mean, I, I, you can point to, to people, you can point to, to outliers, but it's pretty indisputable. So if that's uh, built into us, if that's in our DNA, then I, there's probably only so far we can go beyond that point, which women will start to become kind of dissatisfied with men. Maybe, maybe I, I would want to hear this more from women than for men, because my instinct yeah. tells me that men, when I hear that from a man, I, I, I worry that this is man policing men's man card. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, but but obviously, yeah, I, I agree with the point. I agree with the point. I agree that we don't know. I agree we're in uncharted territory. I agree with that. I agree that there's a lot of, um, there's trade-offs and, and that there's men who are having a much harder time in, in society because of these trade-offs. Um, and I agree that there are differences between men and women. And so that's part of why I feel like we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, maybe, maybe we could... Um leave it on a, on a positive note that something that doesn't get much press mm -hmm. is that most relationships between men and women are frankly doing pretty good. Like men and women seem to really dig each other's company and most romantic relationships, actually most romantic relationships end, right? Because we, we, if you just look at the, the total number of romantic relationships, we all, if, if people are looking for monogamy, which seems to be something that people are interested in, they go through a lot of partners before they find one that, that fits well. So I guess if you add up all the relationships, most of them in. But when people decide on each other, for the most part, it tends to work pretty well. There, there's a lot of unhappiness out there, but and we, and we tend to focus on that. But um, I don't know. I'm I'm optimistic about men and women. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Um, I think. I think. Um, What's your advice? What's your advice for 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 people trying to find a good relationship, trying to find a good long term relationship, trying to be happy in a relationship? What's what? How would you distill it down? If I had to do it in a sentence or two, I would say if you're if you're looking for monogamy, um, and and I, by the way, I I don't care what people do. I'm I'm not interested in people if people get married, don't get married, or have polycules or whatever. That's, that's not my place to say that. But if monogamy is what you're interested in, it's something that I've I've looked at for 20 years here. And my advice would be um, to really understand your patterns and the manner by which you choose relationships before you decide to commit to somebody, to knowing yourself before you try to bring someone else into your life. Um, and you can never fully know yourself, in my estimation. That's something that that the psychoanalytic thinkers have have been saying for for decades, and I think it's entirely true. You can we can never completely know ourselves, but we can at least identify the patterns that we've been enacting, and we can question those patterns and choose the ones that are working and reject the ones that aren't. I think that's good advice. I would I would love to continue this conversation, but I, I you you've been so generous with your time, and we've had such a, a lively, beautiful conversation. I'm afraid to 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 push my luck, and and you know, also we also came to a nice ending point. So yeah. well, um, let's do it again sometime. This yeah, is Sean, this is this has been a really, really, really a joy and a pleasure, and uh, I, I I really appreciate you you giving me the time, um, and I, I love talking to people like you who I almost never talk to on the channel, but I talk to in real life who are uh, just just thoughtful and, and curious and open and um, just a joy to talk to of someone who obviously is a, a great professional at what you do. So uh, thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it. And, and Ami, it was, it was really good to talk to you. I hope we get to do this again. This was a lot of fun and I appreciate the invite.